Morning, everyone. Welcome to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Uh, we are going to uh, begin in prayer, and then I'm going to uh, share Psalm 76 this morning in preparation for communion. So um, I'm moving this a little bit, so don't think it's an earthquake or anything. Okay. So um, let me open in prayer first. Dear Jesus, thank you, Lord, um, for being with us today. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring our spirits to seek more of you, Lord. Help us, dear Jesus, to fulfill your wishes and your your um, your goals, Lord, in this hour, I pray. And, and give, fill our mouths with your words, dear Jesus. Amen. All right, well, I have to tell you, um, last Sunday after the service, I felt ambitious, so I went on to Psalm 76 to read it ahead of time, and so I could really pray into it and um, have the whole week to really think about it. And when I read the Psalm, I was very, I have to say, disappointed. It wasn't one of the ones we we love, like uh, the Lord is my shepherd, or uh, uh, I don't know, I, I'm just drawing a blank, but you know what I mean, like all those awesome Psalms that we love. And um, I, I just closed my book. I was like, I don't like that Psalm. I don't really wanna share that Psalm. So then the next day, I took out my Bible and I, I looked and I said, you know what? I like 75 better, Psalm 75. So I'm going to really read that and, and study that one, I think, and uh, get ready uh, with that one. So I um, read it and I closed my Bible and went to sleep. And the next day, I... Um, prayed about it and I just kept asking Holy Spirit give me something you know I'm feeling dried up here I, I need something and so um, the next day is, was Wednesday when everything happened at Capitol Hill and so um, I really didn't even go back to the Psalms that day I was just praying on my face and crying out to God for judgment and justice and and peace in our country and um so it was about Thursday or Friday I'm gonna say Friday I went back to 76 and the whole psalm changed in front of my eyes I was like oh my lord oh my lord this is incredible this is an incredible psalm this is something that um I didn't see before and so um, I read it over and read it over and it's powerful what the Lord says to us but before we actually look at that I want us to get some background on probably what that psalm is about so if you want you can turn to Isaiah 37 but I'm just gonna do a pretty quick uh, overview and I'm sure I'm going to be missing some things, but my goal isn't to give an exact account line by line, but to give you a, sort of just an overview of what, what was going on, that why this psalm was probably written. So back in this time, um, there was a king of Assyria who was a, a very powerful conqueror. Every place he went, he conquered he looted, he plundered, he he robbed, he he killed, he destroyed, and he just kept marching on. And then he finally came to um, Hezekiah, um, and the king there, King Hezekiah, and um, he basically said, "I'm." I'm going to conquer you, just surrender. And Hezekiah went before he he got his scribes and all his important 
uh, people around him, one being Isaiah, and said, look, you know, this this king, he's, he's pretty powerful, and uh, we need to pray. And so um, they prayed, and, um, and basically... Um, they told um, the king of uh, Syria, you know, we're not going to surrender to you. So the king of Syria was furious. I mean, furious. He had plundered. He had, um, he had taken over. He was the greatest conqueror there was in the land at that time. And who was Hezekiah? Who was Hezekiah, this king that was going to say no to him? So he gave his messenger um, a letter to take back to Hezekiah and to read it to him, not just deliver it, but to read it to him, to add insult to injury. He sent his messenger to tell him that, um, uh, let me find it, um, verse 10, I think it is. Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. In other words, don't trust God. God's lying to you. God, the Almighty, is lying to you. Why? Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers gave, have destroyed? In other words, he's saying, I've destroyed all these other gods. I've destroyed all these other gods and I'm going to destroy your people and your God. That's pretty heavy. That is, that's blasphemy if I ever heard it. Saying to God, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to destroy you. And, and Hezekiah could not believe. He, 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 his mind was literally blown that someone would threaten his savior his king his lord his god and so he 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 prayed and um and um the lord said listen to what the lord said to hezekiah O lord of hosts god of israel i'm sorry this is what um hezekiah prayed uh lord of hosts god of israel the one who dwells between the cherubim. You are God. You alone. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O oh Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O oh Lord, and see. Hear all the words of uh, Seneca Karim. He's the king of uh, Assyria. Which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their lands. They've destroyed them. And they have cast their gods into the fire. Because their gods were made of wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, save us from this hand. That all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Lord. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the Lord's word. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn, the daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. So there. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your servants you have reproached the Lord and said, By the multitude of my chariots. I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter its farthest height to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk water, and with the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the brooks of defense. 
Did you not hear long ago how I made it? From ancient times that I formed it? Have I brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins? Therefore, their inhabitants had little power. They were dismissed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, as grain blighted before it's grown. But I know your dwelling place, your going out and your coming in, and your rage against me. Because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my eyes, my ears, I'm sorry. Therefore, I will put my hook in your nose in my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way you came. And this shall be a sign to you. This is a prophetic, and I have a note here. This is a prophetic word for Lord of the Harvest, Christian Fellowship. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself, and the second year which springs from the same, also in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them, and the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah, praise shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant. And those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into the city, says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and my servant's David's sake. And then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 and when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. And so then the king of Assyria departed, went away, returned home, and he went into his temple, and while he was praying, his sons murdered him. You know, I talked about this um, in another psalm. You know, evil, evil um, produces evil. And so... The great king of Assyria was murdered by the hands of his own children. So that gives us some background on this psalm, Psalm 76. Now apparently a pastor has taught this before because I have little notes here, uh, just a few. In Judah, in Judah, God is known. And I have written above there the famous one. God is the famous one. His name is great in Israel. It's famous. In Salam also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the arrows of the bow in the shield and sword of battle. We saw that. We saw that with um, Hezekiah. God went ahead, broke their arrows, destroyed their swords and shields. You are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. If we think of mountains being great, he's more glorious than if there were mountains of plunder, if the enemy had captured and, 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 and looted and took all the riches of the world and made mountains into them. They would be, God is greater than that. God is greater than that. And the mountains can also represent God's divine action. That when he does something, um, it happens and it's great and it's awesome. His greatness is compared to mountains, huge, immovable. I love that. You are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted were plundered. You know, the stout-hearted, they, they came to those cities, to those countries to plunder, to get their riches, to take the spoils. And yet, they were spoiled. They were destroyed. They have sunk into their sleep. 
and none of the mighty men have found the use of their hands. God killed them while they were sleeping. They didn't even know what hit them. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse were cast into a deep sleep. And I have a word over that for God of Jacob, transformer. See, God can. We, we get so uh, downtrodden. We get so hopeless. And we forget that God can transform our situations into his glory. We just have to keep praying and trusting and having faith. You yourself, notice, and I remember Pastor saying something, when words repeated like that, it means it's very significant. You yourself, you, awesome one, are to be feared. Not the king of uh, Assyria, not wooden gods or stone gods. You are to be feared. You are awesome. You are the mountain of greatness. And who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? Can you imagine king of Assyria was, was the things he said to our God? And you know what? I, I really believe the Lord didn't like it. He, he, he didn't like it. He's, he's probably a little angry to say the least. You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment to deliver all the oppressed of the earth. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. Now I have a little word, uh, two words written here. Fear someone. With the remainder of wrath, you shall gird yourself. You know, sometimes God takes the wrath of man and uses it for his own plans. And it looks like God lost. It looks like man won. But it's not really true. Think about... um when uh, the Jews were slaves in Egypt, the wrath of man was working against the Jews. But God took that, delivered them, and used it. Used it as victory. Think about Jesus. All the, all the things he went through. All the, all the scorning and, and all the rebuking and, uh, and the names he was called. Can you only imagine... I mean, I, I, I heard over and over again reporters saying the things people were saying as they stormed the Capitol, the language was unbelievable. I believe that those kind of words were, were, were shouted at Jesus as he made his journey to the cross. I can only imagine what people were saying. It was a mob scene watching Jesus walk to his cross. And yet that wrath of man striking out against God turned it was what god wanted for victory that his son would be put to death the devil didn't win even though the devil thought he did jesus rose again and was victorious so sometimes when you're feeling down and you think why is this happening pray into it that god is using this for something bigger something better something that will display will display his greatness so the last stanza, make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. He shall cut out the spirit of princes. He is awesome to the kings of the earth. We do serve an incredibly awesome God. And so often we believe he's small. We believe that he's not going to hear us. We, we really do. We shortchange him. Look what he did. Hezekiah, Isaiah, went before him, prayed, asked for help. And boy, did he deliver. Killed 180 some thousand of the finest soldiers in their sleep, left the king of Assyria totally helpless. Do we believe God will do that for us? 
Do we believe in this hour of, of uncertainty about our lives? Do we trust God to move? Do we trust God that he really has things under control? So I, I think it's, it's very interesting. When I read this the first time, I didn't see God's glory in it. I didn't see God's greatness in it. But in one day, or a couple days, do you know what I mean? It all changed for me. My, my, my circumstances changed. My country changed. Something happened. My eyes were open and I, what I saw was not good. And so now this psalm became something important to me. It changed for me. I, I, I think the takeaway, really uh, a couple things. I want you to know that God is great and God is on your side. And we just need to really pray. We could see Hezekiah, Isaiah, they prayed. And that's a real key. And we need to be open. You know, God, you know, we want to see you high and lifted up. We want to see you get the glory out of this. Help us during this time. But the takeaway, too, I got was life is so fragile, it can change in an instant. I read this on Sunday. I read this on Monday. But by Wednesday, my eyes had changed. My heart had changed. My vision had changed. God moves that quickly. We need to be always prepared, always be willing to shift gears, to, to open our minds to what God wants us to think, open our hearts to what God wants us to feel. You know, so many of us think we're right. In fact, we all think we're right. And it started from the beginning with Eve. She thought she was right. She challenged God right from the beginning. And so often we do that without realizing we're challenging God. We're saying, no, you know what? I know better. I know more. So we are in, um, at least for me, I've never witnessed anything like this in this country. Maybe some of you have come from other countries and this is uh, common to see uh, protests become something unbelievable in front of your eyes. I've never witnessed that. So it just made me realize that I can be comfortable today and it all changes in one split second. So I, I need to be really, I need to be centered on Christ, nothing else. I can't be centered on a government. I can't be centered on a political party. I can't be centered on a man. I, I need to be centered on Jesus Christ. And then you know what? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't. Uh -oh. And now you know what? I feel that I am at peace. I, I really do. I, I don't feel threatened. I don't feel worried. I'm at peace. I know that God is behind all of this. So get your elements now. I um, hope that made sense to you. It made sense to me <laughs> because I experienced and sometimes it's our experiences that bring us sight that that help us wherever you're at right now trust God that that's where he wants you that that he's going to he's going to instantly do something with that I shouldn't say instantly because God's time is not our time correct so anyway um let's get our element our first is our bread and um Again, I just want to pray into this and then we can partake. Dear Jesus, Lord, when you walked that walk to the cross and people were calling you the most vile names we could ever imagine, if we could just picture like a mob scene going after you, but there were soldiers guarding you, because they had a bigger plan, a more evil plan. Dear Jesus, help us to appreciate and thank you in dying that 
death on the cross to set us free, to give us eyes to see, ears to hear. And God, help us in this hour to realize that nothing is too great. Nothing is too hard. If we turn to you, trust in you, and pray to you, in Jesus' name. Now, if you want to get your drink, dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for your blood. Your blood is powerful. It cleanses. It washes us clean. Thank you for your, your blood, Lord, that you gave willingly that we all may, we all may live. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, have a blessed day. What I've been doing after service is I, I read the word, I take some time and I pray, and I really think about what Pastor is sharing. And um, I just ask that you, you know, okay, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Amen. Well, what I want to, I'm assuming we're still on. Uh, okay, uh, what I want to accomplish today is to actually go between uh, the books of the Psalms. I want to do Psalm 70 through 76 is my goal. Jan already covered 76, so that makes my job a bit easier. But I, I, I want to review where we've come from. Psalm 42 through 72 was book two. That's the, the Exodus book. And so book three, the Leviticus book, starts with Psalm... <clears throat> All right, I'm, I'm having some problems here with my screen. I don't know if that's technical... I guess I'm having some technical problems here. Uh, I don't know if it's on the Lord of the Harvest side or it's on our side. Maybe uh, Robert, Andrea can text me and let me know what's going on here at the screen. And it's saying that there's a, uh, a poor connection. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what I got from the text is, were, are we good, though, for the... Um, screen uh, at, uh, that other people are receiving. Are, are other people getting this okay? I need a, I need a text for that so I, I know how to, how to deal with what I'm dealing with. Okay, well, we're, we're having some glitches, so uh, we'll just do the best we can here. This is a, an important day but we'll do the best we can and hopefully we'll get it all on the podcast. And if, if it's been in and out for those who are listening, then we'll just have to go back and uh, listen uh, to the podcast. Uh, some people are saying they can hear but not see. Well, as long as you can hear, that's a good thing. Uh, praise the Lord. So any rate, going back to the review here. Yep. The, the text I got is just plow through. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're going to plow through here. So book two started with Psalm 42, runs to Psalm 72. Book three, which is the Leviticus book, um, starts with Psalm 73 uh, and goes on through to Psalm 89. If we look at the Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus book, first of all, Genesis is about beginnings. Exodus is about who are the true people of God. Leviticus is about holiness. So, so, so actually, when we're going from book two to book three in the Psalms, we're moving from the identity of the people of God, specifically as it's seen in David the king, but we're moving now into holiness 
And so we want to, we really want to um, see this overview correctly. Book one of the Psalms also, so it speaks of the history, history of Israel in terms of, first of all, book one is the kingship of David. Book two is the kingship of Solomon. Book three then is the divided kingdom where Israel and Judah are divided. So we need to also see it both from the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus perspective, as well as the history of Israel. The five books speak of the, the history of Israel under the kings and in exile and into the restoration of the land. So what we are doing, uh, what we are doing is, uh, wow, <laughs> we're, well, I'm getting, I'm getting all kinds of messages from people here. I'm getting messages from people who can see and hear, some people who can only hear, some people it's flowing in and out. So you know what? This is all out of whack for me. I, that, that for me is, is it, it just, it, my mind is completely removed from the message when I know that there are technical problems. So it's time for me to, uh, it's time for me. I'm going to pray. I'm going to just have a word of prayer, get myself focused and centered and uh, and get, get back to trying to share this word in spite of the messages that are coming across my screen. So Father, Lord, I always see significance, prophetic significance, if you will, uh, in everything that takes place in our lives. We're having great problems right now in the body of Christ, hearing you and seeing you. We're having difficulties with your word coming through to lead us, to guide us, to teach us, to show us, Lord. We, there's so much interference, Lord. There's so much difficulties. They come from powers and principalities. They're coming from government. They're coming from human beings. They're coming from demonic forces. They're, they're, they're at work within the church. But Lord, we're going to take a stand with you, Father, yes, Jesus. to speak the truth. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Yes. Amen. I'm just going to go right now to, uh, instead of trying to give the background, which I was, and it's all, it's here, there, and everywhere. I want to go to Psalm 70. Psalm 70 is entitled, A Psalm of David. Psalm 71 does not have a title. It's the only psalm in the second book that does not have a superscription. Um, it's one of the few psalms in the entire does not have a superscription. Now, there's a reason for this. It is, uh, it is tied together. 70 and 71 are related. 71 has no title because it's connected to Psalm 70 before it, which is a Psalm of David, which, which makes all the Psalms, there's a stretch here that runs from Psalm 51 to 72. All but three of those Psalms, actually all but four of those Psalms, are not titled to David. But first of all, uh, the two leading up to this Psalm that are not entitled to David at all, 51 through 65 are all Psalms of David. 66 and 67 are Psalms, but not given to David because there's the community's response to David's Psalms that run from 51 through 65. 68, 69, and 70, again, are Psalms of David. 71, there's no title, but that's because of its relationship to 70. Oftentimes, when a psalm does not have a title, it's, it's connected somehow intimately. It says, this is, follows right along with the psalm before it. So Psalm 71 is also a psalm of David because it relates to a historical time period in David's life. And then Psalm 72 it says the superscription is of Solomon, but of Solomon in Hebrew can also be for Solomon. 
So you see David is speaking from 51 all the way to 72. And we saw that in 51 to 72, uh, David is, is referring to all the, the difficulties, the hindrances, the betrayals that took place in his life. And we said that uh, Psalm 69 brings us to the place where Absalom, David's son, betrayed him and tried to deliver. God delivered David. Now, that brings us to Psalm 70. And this says to the choir master of David, for a memorial offering, for a remembrance to God. The memorial offering was reminding God of the great works that he had done. And it was either reminding God of the great works he'd done previously, do them again, or it was reminding God and thanking God that he had remembered to do that. Now, even after David reconsolidated the kingdom after the time of Absalom, at the end of his life, he still had some very difficult situations. And we won't look at it specifically, but after he had reconsolidated the kingdom after the rebellion of Absalom, there was still another rebellion, a rebellion of Sheba. And that's in 2 Samuel 20. And I'm just going to read the first couple verses there and go right into Psalm 70. Now there happened to be in Israel a worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bekri, a Benjamite, and he blew the trumpet and said, we have no portion in David. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, O Israel. And listen to this, the Israel that had rebelled against David, that David forgave when he came back into kingship, that had realigned itself with David, now turns against David again. So all the men of Israel withdrew, withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. Sheba is a Benjamite. He came from the tribe of Saul. Even after Saul had been deposed, David had been made king over all of Israel. The borders of Israel extended beyond any time in the history of Israel. There was great prosperity and righteousness in this reign. Absalom, David's son, overthrows him. But again, God gives David the victory, reconsolidates the kingdom, and this memory, this bitterness, the bitterness in Saul's family that said, David, you stole the kingship from our family. It rises again. And that's, that's what takes place here in Psalms 70 and 71. So let's read what David says in 70. Hurry up, Lord. And he's been saying, hurry up, God, uh, in, in a number of the Psalms. Hurry up, God. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The book of Revelation. Do this now, Lord. I need you now. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who desire my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation, your deliverance, say evermore, God is great. Now this issue of God is great and God's salvation, it's gonna carry over not only into Psalm 71 and 72 to close this second book, which ends with Solomon succeeding David as king, but it's going to carry over into the third book, the holiness book, about the greatness of God, even in the midst of, of, of much difficulty, national difficulty in book three. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not picture David here. David knows he's God's man. David knows he's failed. He sinned with Bathsheba. That's where Psalm 51, this whole uh, sequence of Psalms from 51 to 72, it starts with the failure of David with Bathsheba, the blood guilt on his hand for Bathsheba's husband. And, and that sin was so great 
that's the kind of sin that disqualifies a person for life. But David knows now he's been through all of these betrayals, all of these rebellions, all of these things that have sought to hinder the promises the Lord gave to him that the Lord would make him king and that his seed would succeed and that from his seed the Messiah would come eventually. He knows he's God's man, but here's another, the rebellion of Shebna. And so this man who knows he's right with God, nonetheless, how does he see himself? But I am poor and needy. He identifies himself with the poorest, the most broken, the most vulnerable in the land. And he says, I am too, Lord. They're broken because of of life circumstances, because of injustice. I'm broken because of my sin. See, this is where Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus begins his teaching on what it means to be a disciple of the Lord by referring to a Davidic prophetic perspective. The king, God's man, God has been with him faithfully to deliver him time and time again, but he sees himself as poor and needy. He understands it's not by the might and the strength of his own hand, but it's because of the graciousness of the Lord. And it is his identification that he begins to to formulate a prophetic picture of what discipleship is. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. And so we go right into 71. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Shebna now, at the end of my life, in my old age, is trying to destroy me. I thought All of this was finished, O God, with Absalom. How could something be worse than Absalom, my own son betraying me? How could something be worse than Saul, my own king, my father-in-law betraying me? How could something be worse than, than, than the people of God betraying me constantly? And see, there's a picture here, a prophetic picture that goes even beyond David and discipleship and the kingship of Israel. And it pictures Jesus, everyone deserted Jesus. See, this is where Jesus got encouragement from the Psalms. This is how Jesus was able to follow the Father's will through the darkest hour. We go right into 71, and it's related to 70. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. And this is going to be a psalm about the righteousness of the Lord. And see, it's important to understand what I've already said about righteousness, and I I have to define this. The righteousness of God is not simply something that God imputes to us through the death of Jesus. That's our receiving Jesus' righteousness through faith in Christ. God the Father declaring that we're righteous because Jesus has taken on our sin. Yes, that is God's righteousness. Righteousness isn't just when we walk in sanctification and, and, and become righteous in our, our behavior. That's the imparted righteousness of the Lord. Righteousness starts with the delivering power of God. God in his faithfulness, delivering his people from their enemies, from their sin, from their failures, from their unbelief, from their struggles, from their oppression. God steps in and delivers on his own terms his unrighteous, weak, unbelieving people. He steps in and he gets us the victory. See, that's where God's righteousness starts. It, it, it can't start just with something that God imputes to me in Christ. It can't start just with my behavior. Oh, I'm, I'm living a righteous life. It's got to start in God. Everything must start in God. And his righteousness is the Lord standing up and saying, I am with you. I am for my people. Yes, David, here it comes again. Here it comes again but I'm there to deliver you. And I want you to understand this because we're going to see righteousness in Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Never let me be put to shame. Remember we said being put to shame means that we do not accomplish the purpose for which God raised us up. God, when, when the psalmist cries out, 
Don't let me be shamed. He's saying, Lord, let me fulfill the purpose for which you raised me up and destined me. That's what the Lord was doing in Psalm 76 when he delivered Judah, when he delivered Hezekiah. He was saying, no Assyrian is going to stop my people from having the purpose for which I've raised them up come to pass. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear and save me. Now watch, there's going to be a definition of God's righteousness in Psalm 71. First of all, God delivers and rescue us, rescues us. That's a manifestation of his righteousness. God inclines his ear and saves us when we cry out to him. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. God's righteousness. You have given the command to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. God commands our deliverance. This is his righteousness. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked one. Now I'm reading ESV. Deliver me, rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked one, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. Now let me read that from a, a, a Hebrew translation. Oh my God, let me escape from the power of the lawless ones, the wicked ones, from the hand of the enslaver, and from him who would cloud happiness, him who would poison happiness. So, so, so what David is saying, Sheba represents this, the wicked one represents this. Those who oppose God's purposes represent this. They are wicked, they are enslavers, and they are the ones who poison the cup of blessing that God would give us. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. Back to Psalm 51. I was formed in iniquity. But you took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been seen as a portent to many, as a sign, as a wonder. It's a Hebrew word that we use for signs and wonders. I'm a sign and wonder. I am a sign and wonder. Why? Because of your righteousness, because you're there to deliver me. I am a sign and wonder, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Now remember, David's in his old age. It's like, I can't take too much of this anymore. I, I have people send me prayer requests. Pastor, I don't know how much, how much I can take of this anymore. Well, you're, you're in good company. David says it here. He says, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life, consult together in Hebrew, the, my, the soul watchers, the soul watchers consult together concerning my life. Those who are waiting, he's old and I'm going to destroy him now in his old age. And they say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is none to deliver him. At this time of, at this time of, of, of old age, difficulty, David is struggling to have faith in the Lord. Oh God, be not far from me. Oh my God, make haste to help me. May my accusers be born and disgraced. May they, they be covered. So there's, there's, there's something really interesting there about may they be covered. I'm, 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 I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm looking at it in the, um, in the Hebrew there. Cover them up, Lord. Remove them. Blind my eyes to who they are, O oh God, and let me see you. May they be covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually 
and will praise you yet more and more. And then it says, my mouth will tell of your righteousness. See, what is God's righteousness? That he delivers David, that he is faithful to the promises he's made to David. My mouth will tell of your righteousness, of your deeds of salvation all the day. Their number is past my knowledge. Now, he's saying something. I'm going to describe your righteousness. I'm going to talk about the, your mighty deeds of salvation, the mighty acts that reveal your greatness. I'm going to talk about those, but, Lord, but I really don't know how to enumerate them. I don't know how to, I can't do justice. What I'm going to say about your righteousness, I cannot do justice. However, with the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come. I'm going to bring them. I will remind all, all the people of your righteousness, yours alone. Now, I want you to see here. There's this connection between God's righteousness and God's salvation. He uses the term salvation. Now, now in, in the Hebrew, uh, in, in the Hebrew language, the word salvation is the word Yeshua. Okay, it's, it's the name of Jesus. It, it comes from uh, two Hebrew words. It comes from a word, uh, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm trying to find it here in the Hebrew. It comes from the word ish, and it comes from the word shua, ishua, yeshua. And it's very interesting. Ish, that Hebrew word, indicates God's victory over dangers that pose a threat to our very being, to our very identity, to our very existence. Ish has to do with the victory that God gives us in terms of who we are. Shua, on the other hand, speaks of victory over perils that threaten our power and our might. So, so what salvation is, what deliverance is, is that God delivers us and God delivers our ability to carry out in the purposes of the Lord with strength and might, what he desires of it. So salvation means God rescues us and then God rescues our ability to carry out his purposes. That's what salvation means in Hebrew. So when David ties in the salvation of the Lord with God's righteousness, this is what he's saying. Now I'm 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 gonna go, I'm I'm gonna go here to a Hebrew commentary. This is Samuel or Samson Raphael Hirsch, S.R. Hirsch, one of my 19th century rabbinic commentators. And when he gets into the language, it's 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 so powerful because he says the righteousness of the Lord and the salvation of the Lord that David is referring to here in Psalm 71 and Psalm 70, how God is going to deliver him from his enemies. Remember what we said last week. It goes back to David's sin with Bathsheba. David's sin with Bathsheba should have disqualified him from being the king. It should have disqualified him from carrying out God's purposes. If Saul were removed, David should have been removed too. But this is what God's righteousness is all about. And, and listen to this. This is, this is incredible. This is incredible. God's righteousness has to do with the fact that God has established in the universe cause and effect. Cause and effect, I'm reading Hirsch here, which God himself has founded the order of the world upon, means that any man who commits a sin would surely have to perish. The cause is I sin, the effect is I perish. God has established that order in the universe. The universe is run with a moral order, not just a, a see, see, the church is really messed up right now. It sees power as being supernatural power, this, this authority in God to name things and proclaim things, this power and might to get things done, and, and that's part of power. 
But the universe is not just this authority to move supernaturally, authority to move politically. The power in the universe is that there is a moral power. So moral power must combine with supernatural power. Supernatural power without moral power. We said that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom, is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. What's the end of the Sermon on the Mount? The end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, many will cast out devils in my name, prophesy in my name, perform miracles in my name, and I will say unto them, I did not know you, depart from me. See, see, you can have supernatural power without moral power. And see, the Sermon on the Mount starts with moral power. And here's where moral power begins. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. A moral position that puts me in the place of submission to God, obedience to God. And it ends by saying that if you just walk in supernatural power without the moral power, then you're building your house on sand. This is what's happening right now in this nation. This is what's going on. This is what's taking place. We are seeing the foundations that so many Christians have built their houses on. It's sand. Because we see and understand spiritual power. We're going to name this. We're going to proclaim this. We're going to prophesy this. We're going to bind this. We're going to declare these people healed. And they are healed. But Jesus says, but supernatural power and authority without moral power and authority. False prophets. Because he is saying, basically, you can actually heal the sick, cast out demons, and prophesy in my name. And that is if it's lacking moral power, that's false prophecy. So, there's this, back to Hirsch, there is this moral cause and effect that God has placed into the universe. It's a law. And the Lord says that the consequences of sin bring man's speedy downfall. We sin, we fall. David sinned in Psalm 51, but he hasn't fallen. What is David saying here is the real, are we, we got to get at the root at what the real righteousness of the Lord is. Hirsch continues. He says, for the sake of man, God in his mercy suspends the law of cause and effect, which he himself has made. Any man, even if he has been guilty of the most heinous of crimes, has the opportunity to re repent and return to God through genuine salvation. This is that word, salvation. This is what, what we're getting at, the meaning of salvation. Through genuine salvation, man can become a new creation, a new creature. Paul talks about this. We're a new creation in Christ. Well, they were talking about it in the Old Testament too. It's the transformation that God works into the moral order of his universe. It's called his righteousness, where a man who has forfeited his destiny by his rebellion and sin can become a new creation, a new person can attain renewed moral strength and new joy in doing good and in general even reach a spiritual level that he did not have before he'd sinned. Now see, David's, in, in terms of relating God's righteousness to God's salvation, he's talking about being a new creation. He's talking about a new song. He's talking about God placing new praise, God doing a new thing in our lives. And this is what God's righteousness is all about. God can blot out happenings as if they had never occurred so that the past sins will not leave scars upon the life of the sinner or upon his spirit. This suspension of the law and of cause and effect for the law of God giving us dominion over 
a return to him, giving us a, a, a mastery in returning to him is the greatest of all of God's wondrous works. That God would suspend our destruction and make us a new creation in Christ. This is the greatest of all of God's wondrous works. When David is saying, my mouth will tell of your righteousness and your, of your deeds of salvation all the day, with the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come and I will remind all people of your righteousness, yours alone. He's talking about a God who can come in and erase the stains that our sin has caused us, can forgive, can make a, an entirely new creature and an entirely new creation because he is righteousness. This is what his salvation is. This is what his deliverance is. The suspension of the law of cause and effect for the sake of this new creation is the greatest of all of God's wondrous works. It can be performed only by the one who himself has instituted this law in his world. He who is the righteous deliverer, who holds the world and its course in his hands. It is an act of divine omnipotence which can be truly experienced and sensed only by a man who, like David, has become a true master of salvation, master of the process of God's recreation in his own life and has thus become master over his past. Now he uses, he refers to the term kafar, or kofar. That's the Hebrew word for atonement. And so what he's saying, he says, for atonement, the specific description of this extraordinary act of God's righteousness. God's righteousness is God's atonement. It is the power, the power that makes a weak man, an Enosh, a Givor, a Givorim, a mighty man. It is the power that can overcome the past and bury it. So what Hirsch did here is he tied together God's righteousness with God's salvation. His righteousness, first and foremost, is that he remakes us, remolds us, reshapes us, buries our past, and gives us a new start. But then he ties it in with the word atonement. It's atonement that causes this, the death of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it is about God imputing his righteousness to us. The death of Christ is about God shaping us and molding us and forming us in sanctification to live righteously. But it is first and foremost about atonement. Jesus entered in. The, way, the reason God can undo or supersede the law of cause and effect in the universe because Jesus entered in as our atonement, as the sacrifice. He stepped in and took all of the transgression, all of the devastation from sin, all of our missing the mark into himself and left it in the grave and was raised from the dead. So David continues, verse 17, O God, from my youth you've taught me and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Now this is important. Book one, the first part of the Psalms, it's about the establishment of David's kingship. It's about God making David king. Book two is about, it's all about God preserving David's kingship. Genesis, God starts with the church. He makes us who we are. He delivers David from Saul, but then he preserves David's kingship in book two of the Psalms, the Exodus book. In Genesis, he creates his people. In Exodus, he preserves them, makes them alive. He delivers them into the land. 
Even David's own sin does not stop God's preservation. All the enemies, all the betrayals, inward and outward, do not stop that. That's book number two. Book number two and book number one speaks of leadership in the church. We have a five-fold ministry in the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. God makes them. That's book one of the Psalms. God preserves them. He forms them and shapes them. That's book two of the Psalms. You need to understand, where did the church begin in the New Testament? It doesn't begin at Pentecost. It begins before Pentecost. It begins when the Lord is raising up his apostles, raising up leaders for 40 days and 40 nights. The church began. The Lord called his disciples as apostles in the Gospels. After he's raised from the dead, he commissions them into their apostolic ministry. The church doesn't start with the Spirit being poured out. The church starts with God forming and shaping leaders. David, book one of the Psalms. David, book two of the Psalms. Raising up a leader, preserving a leader. He preserved them through their, their, their betrayal, through their fear, through their misunderstanding of, of his kingdom purposes, and he makes them into leaders. But then the church has to become the church. The church has to move from, from God raising up leaders and God forming leaders into a church being molded and shaped by those leaders. And that's what David is saying here. At the end of my life, he's saying... Do not forsake me, verse 18, until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those who are to come. In verse 22, he says, I will praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy. The Holy One of Israel is the one who uses atonement to deliver us in righteousness and save his people. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, my soul also which you have redeemed, and my tongue will talk of your righteousness all the day long, for they have been put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. To whom will all these things be declared? To the next generation. And so Psalm 72 is for Solomon. Solomon is the next generation. And so the purpose of leadership in the body of Christ, leadership must be raised up. It must be purified. It must be, but it must impart the truth to the next generation. It's got to raise up another generation. It's got to raise up the church. Now, 72, and keep in mind, when we were reading a psalm a day, 72 was written on Wednesday, the 6th, when everything broke out, everything broke out in the capital, here's the prophetic psalm we're reading. Give the king your justice to Solomon, the one that's going to receive the kingship from David. The first four verses of Psalm 72 offer prayers to God for the king. For for now now the apostles and prophets David and 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 Nathan are now imparting to Solomon. They're praying for him. That this vision that David has of the righteousness and salvation and atonement of the Lord, how God preserves his people for his kingdom purposes. He's now praying for the king, and look what he says: Give the king your justice, O God, your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Picturing what took place in the capital, on Wednesday, I'm reading Psalm 72 about the ideal king. This is what a real leader looks like, church. You let the scripture be your judge. I'm not saying you judge who's a righteous leader or not. Let the scripture judge for you. And it's righteousness and it's justice. And righteousness was just declared in Psalm 71. And now justice is brought in with righteousness. Righteousness is how God transforms a man. And justice is how a transformed man 
takes what God has done and imparts it in his leadership to all those under him, whether that's an apostle or a prophet, a president, a king, a prime minister, whatever. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills righteousness. Now, he goes from righteousness and justice to shalom, wholeness, well-being, blessing and prosperity and righteousness. And it's linking justice with shalom. Mishpat with shalom in the Hebrew. Real justice is that people have an access to the blessings of God. And the mountains are shalom and the hills are righteousness. Shalom and justice even transcend righteousness. And notice, may he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. And there, this is righteous rule. Righteous rule is taking care of the needy and crushing those who would oppress the needy. That's, that's the righteous king. Verses five through seven speak of internal security in, a, in, a, in a, a, a just king's rule and reign. May they fear you while the sun endures as long as the moon throughout all generations. May the king be like the rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and may peace abound till the moon be no more. There's the internal security, the internal blessings that a righteous ruler brings. 8 through 11, international power. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. So there's domestic, domestic blessing and there's international order. That's what a righteous ruler brings. And then verses 12 through 17 say, and if the king wants to have internal blessing and security and uh, uh, international influence and peace, here's what he needs to be doing, 12 through 17. For he delivers the needy when the needy calls, the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. Now, he does those things. And again, it's, it's, it's Matthew 25. How, how do the nations know if they're serving Christ in the gospel? I was hungry and you gave me food. I was in prison and you visited me. I, I was homeless and you gave me a place to stay. I had no clothing and you gave me clothing. They take care of the poor, the orphan, the widow, the refugee. And when they're doing that, this is the other things that take place. Verse 15, may he live long given him. There's economic prosperity. May prayer be made for him continue. He's being prayed for. Whoever ends up being president, we better be praying for that president. May prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day. When the leader is blessing the people, the people bless the leader. Shalom. We have a picture of shalom. May there be abundance of grain in the land on the tops of the mountains. May it wave. May its fruit be like Lebanon. There's, there's, there's economic security. There's food for everyone. There's blessing for everyone. And then it says, and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. The cities enjoy peace and prosperity. May his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him and all nations call him blessed. In other words, he becomes a model of the blessedness of the Lord. And then book two closes 
with a blessing to the Lord. The Lord is the one who's done this in David. The Lord is the one who will do this in Solomon. The Lord is the one who will raise up righteous leaders and righteous nations. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Book two is over and and we're going to take a few minutes to look at a couple Psalms in book number three. We go into book three, Leviticus book, the book of holiness. It's not only the book of holiness, we, we have to move. We, we need to understand what holiness is in essence. Leviticus is all about holiness, but holiness has to be defined the way scripture defines holiness. It means being set apart unto the Lord for God's purposes. And Leviticus speaks of how the unclean can become clean. The impure can become pure. The unrighteous can walk in holiness. It also speaks, if book one is about the reign of David and book two in the Psalms is about the reign of Solomon, where it ends, book three is about the divided kingdom. What happens in 73, as we move from 72, well, the first thing is look at the superscription of book three, a psalm of Asaph. Now, you're going to have 11 consecutive psalms, 73 through 83, are going to be psalms of Asaph. All right? Now, I want to show you something. Remember, we said 51 through 72 in, in the previous book were the psalms of David, the second Davidic Psalter, where he talks not only about how God established him as king, but now how God preserves him as king. But look at the psalm that, that happened, that occurred in book two, just before Psalm 51. 51 through 72 is this picture, this picture of David's kingship being preserved by the Lord. What was Psalm 50? Just look back at it. Psalm 50 was a psalm of Asaph. And remember, that's the psalm where God brings all of the earth, heaven and earth, into his throne room of judgment. He brings all his people into the throne room of judgment. And he says, those of you who are steadfast followers of me, you're blessed. Those of you who are wicked, come into my throne room, repent and become blessed too as well. Psalm 50 ended with these words. Look at Psalm 50, 23. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, who follows the way I've established things in the universe, I will show the salvation of God. What did Psalm 71 end with? The David defining that God's righteousness is his salvation. Now, Asaph, Psalm 50, and Asaph, Psalm 73, onward, their book ends. So the so the the Psalter of David, David's second Psalter, where he talks about how God preserves his kingship, has the Psalms of Asaph on either side. Now let me tell you just briefly who Asaph was. He was a prophetic worship leader among David's ministers, among the Levites, among the priests. He's a prophetic worshiper. Now the only 12 Psalms attributed to Asaph are Psalm 50 on one side of David's declaring the righteousness and salvation of the Lord in his own life and how it preserved his kingship. The only Psalms of Asaph are Psalm 50 and then the 11 Psalms that follow Psalm 72. So this prophetic picture, this prophet Asaph is on at the start and the finish, bookends of David's life. It's going to say something here to us. What is consistent about these themes? There, there, are, at least, there, there are at least three things that are consistent about Asaph's Psalms, the 12 that he's given. Number one, God speaks directly. It's a prophet saying, thus says the Lord and the Lord speaks. And it's first person. I will do this and I will do that and I will do this, says the Lord. The Psalms of Asaph speak prophetically for the Lord in first person. God speaks through the prophet. Number two, there is a theme of divine judgment. That's why Psalm 50 started with coming to the throne room of God's judgment. God's judgment 
Do not equate that term with God's punishment. God's judgment is God rendering a judicial decision in the earth and saying, this is how things are going to be. It's God saying yes to the Son of Man and no to the four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. It's God saying yes to the church and no to the idolatry that's trying to destroy the church in America. In fact, it's God saying yes to the church and no to America. It's God's judgment. We cannot put America before the Lord. That's what, that's what Asaph does. He's constantly bringing God's judgment. It means, it means coming into God's presence, having your life evaluated, saying, this is good, let it increase. This is wrong, repent and get out of it. In fact, it's exactly what we see in Revelation 2 and 3, where God takes the seven churches and begins to evaluate them. I'm for this. I'm not for that. Here's what you need to do to overcome. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to start each message to the church with a fresh vision of who I am. That characterizes the Psalms of Asaph. Number one, he speaks in the first person for the Lord. And number two, he speaks of the judgment of the Lord. And number three, he interprets history. He, he, he's very interested in Israel's history and saying this happened here and this happened there and this took place here and this took place there. And here's what God thinks about that. He interprets history. Now, this is what, that's what a real prophet does. We have charismatic prophets who just one prophecy, one vision, one dream after another. That is simply somebody who, that's, a, that's people who know how to prophesy. That doesn't make somebody a prophet. Prophets speak first person for the Lord. They stand in the counsel of the Lord and they don't dream things up from the visions of their own heart. They stand in the counsel of the Lord and they hear what the Lord says. Number two, they proclaim God's judgment. They bring people also. They're in the counsel of the Lord, so they bring people into the counsel of the Lord and cause people to hear God's truth. I'm just quoting you Jeremiah 23. If you want to see what, what a real prophet does, read Jeremiah 23. It also will show you what false prophets do. And third, they evaluate history. And you know how they evaluate history? Based on the word of God. Jeremiah didn't just get his prophecies in some kind of mystical transcendent state. He got them from Deuteronomy. He got them, let me get that. We're running out of power here and we're going to wrap it up. He got his prophecies from Deuteronomy. He got his Deuteronomy, Levitic, Leviticus. He got his prophecies from Exodus and Genesis. That's what the five books of the Psalms are the Genesis book, the Exodus book, the Leviticus book, the Numbers book, the Deuteronomy book. So what happens in 73 when we begin book three? This is what holiness is all about. Look at 73.1. This is where Asaph starts. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. God's goodness. We, we end with God's righteousness and salvation and God's righteous ruler who embraces justice and shalom in book two and in book three, we start with the goodness of God. God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. We talked about the righteous. We talked about the, those who walk in the steadfast love of the Lord. We talk about the faithful. Now we're talking about the pure in heart. Those whose devotion to the Lord, complete devotion to the Lord, makes their hearts pure and causes them to see. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. See, see. if your heart's not pure, you're not seeing God. These people who are claiming, oh, the Lord spoke to me this, the Lord did this, the Lord showed me this. If it's all being filtered into a heart that's not purely devoted to the Lord, what you're hearing and seeing is not the Lord, even though you think it's the Lord. That's, that's a hard thing to embrace, but it's reality. It, it, it doesn't cause us to despair. Oh my God, I can't hear God. It says, yep, this thing of hearing God is going to be very challenging. I better press into the Lord and figure out how to do it. Well, Psalm 73 is going to show us how. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the proud when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. 
we, we leave Psalm 72, this ideal leader, Solomon, and all of a sudden we're in 73 and what we saw in 72 is not there in 73. What happened? Well, remember from the historical view, if book one is the kingship of David, book two is the kingship of Solomon, we're now in the divided kingship. God's people are divided. God's people now have to rise up because it's not good enough just to have apostles and prophets. It's not good enough for the Lord just to be just to be, be shaping and molding the lives of apostles and prophets as if we're Old Testament prophets and it's just a couple people who hear God and the rest of the people are idiots. The church has to come to the place where the church rises up, where the apostles and prophets equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Build up the body of Christ. Bring the church into the unity of the faith. Bring the church into the into maturity. Bring the church into the fullness of the stature of Christ. And so holiness is not equated with a person or an individual. Oh, look at me, I got a holy life. Hey, Pastor Oz is the only holy one at Lord of the Harvest and all the rest of you are idiots and peons. Uh, just bow down to the Holy One, Pastor Oz. That's Old Covenant. New Covenant is all of God's people will be holy. And see, real holiness is a corporate holiness. Real holiness is the church looking like the church. Holiness is not this, a bunch of apostles and prophets out there uh, uh, commanding the church what to do and prophesying over the church. So many Christian leaders base their whole frame of, of reference on, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, I'm a pastor, look at me, I'm somebody. I'm, just, I'm quoting my, my old pastor, Pastor Alex. You say, what, 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 Oz, what are you doing getting up there, uh, walking around saying, look at me, I'm somebody. And I'm like, oh, I'm not doing that until the Lord said, yes, you are. Real holiness is when the holiness extends to the body of Christ. When the church starts acting like the church. It's not just apostles acting like apostles. It's the church acting like the church. So 73 says, we say, what happened between 72 and 73? Well, the wicked triumphed. And the wicked triumphed. And then there's all this description about the wicked uh, starting in verse 4. We're not going to read it. But, but we, 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 we will say this, the wicked, well, one of the characterizations of the wicked in verses 2 through 15 is the wicked not only gain power, not only are prosperous, but they influence the people of God. Look what it says in verse 9. They, that's the wicked, they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. That's, Pastor Jan read Psalm 76. That's what Sennacherib did. He set his mouth against the heaven and his tongue strut through the earth. I'm the mighty king, Sennacherib. Listen to me or off with your head. Look at all the gods I've destroyed. Look at all the peoples I've destroyed. Look at how much power I have. Keep me in power. Look at how much power I have. And then it says, because they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth, therefore his people, that's God's people, turn back to them, to whom? The wicked. And find no fault in them. How do we go from 72, a righteous leader, to 73? God's people are divided and scattered because they're listening to the wicked and not to the Lord and his word, not to the Lord and his prophets. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? See, people who are in power really ignore. It's, it's unbelievable. People without a conscience can ignore God. And just anything they say, anything they do, anything they want, they put a spin to it. They can say one thing one day and contradict themselves the next day, which we've seen a lot of these past four years. Say one thing one day, another thing another day. It's, it's, it doesn't matter because God doesn't know. There's no knowledge of the Most High Seat. See, in ancient times, this is called practical atheism. All the people in the ancient times believed in, in many gods. 
But practical atheism is I can do what I want and God doesn't see it. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches and power. And then here's what the psalmist says. Here's what Asaph, the prophet says. All in vain have I kept my heart pure. God reveals himself. He does good to those who are pure in heart. But I'm, I'm trying to follow you, Lord. And all I see is the wicked prospering and the righteous, the righteous, the pure in heart, they're failing, Lord. I washed my hands in innocence, in vain. I've, done the, I've, I've followed you in vain for all day long, even though I'm righteous, even though I'm trying to follow you, even trying to say it's about Jesus, it's about the gospel. It's not about a political party. It's not about a, a president. All day long, I've been stricken. I've been rebuked every morning. I'm trying to be righteous. Everything's working against me. If I had said, I will speak in this manner, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. And sometimes prophets speak like this. I've said, I've never been so troubled, so frustrated, through so, so, so much. I'm, I'm, I'm bordering on despair constantly because people don't listen to the word. They don't seek the Lord. They, the pl- plainly obvious unrighteousness is going on and, oh, that person's righteous. I mean, I've never been at a place like this. And when I start to talk like this, I become in danger of betraying the generation of your children. I'm, I'm discouraged, and now I'm discouraging everybody else. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome, a horrible burden. Until, until until I went into the sanctuary of God. What's the sanctuary of God? The holy place of God. We're in the Leviticus book, holiness. When I stood in the holiness of God, when I stood in his presence, when I stood in his sanctuary, when I stood where real holiness and real truth emanate, where real righteousness and real atonement and real faithfulness and real truth emanate. When I stood in the sanctuary, I saw, I discerned their end. I discerned, I discerned where they were going to end up. And I'm, I'm going to have to end now too. I, I didn't get to Psalm 74, 75, and 76. Jan covered 76. God moves for Hezekiah. But let me, let me close here. At the start, he says, truly God, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. The pure in heart will see God. When I stood in the sanctuary, when I stood in the place of holiness, I saw. See, this is what the, whole, what the Leviticus book is about. See, and real holiness, where's the king? Well, right now, we, 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 we don't see any king right here. It's the people of God that must rise up corporately and stand in the sanctuary. Real holiness is not individual holiness, though that's an important part of it. Real holiness is corporate holiness. So Mike Osminski can keep every 613 commandments in the Torah, every commandment in the Sermon on the Mount, every commandment in the New Testament. And if his brothers and sisters in Christ aren't in unity with him, and walking in holiness as well, Mike Osminski fails. The purposes for which Mike Osminski fails. So what it is saying as we move from the second book, the first book, God raises up apostles and prophets. Second book, he, he makes those apostles and prophets righteous. He preserves their leadership. But the third book, it says, and holiness then is when those apostles and prophets impart that righteousness that God has worked into their lives to the body of Christ and the body of Christ corporately comes into what God wants. So do you understand why right now the worst thing that can happen in this nation to the church is that we align ourselves with this political party or that political party, this presidential candidate or that presidential candidate 
and it costs us our unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to put that aside. We have to put that nonsense aside. And we need, we need, we need to stand in the sanctuary and receive the vision of true holiness, God's people cooperating with each other. Grant us grace for this to take place. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.